talking with the experts. Leadership begins from within. Michelle Thompson explains why building relationships is essential to building business and understanding yourself, having healthy boundaries and knowing your worth. Yeah, absolutely. I often will recommend uh, organizations that I work with to get rid of the word employee altogether, take it out of their policies and procedures, just eliminate it. Because I think that when you um, when you think of someone as an employee or you speak in terms of the multiples, so my team, a team, you forget that those are individual people. And, you know, while it is difficult to lead individuals because everybody has, you know, uh, certain needs, it is possible to do that without it, you know, causing an extraordinary amount of energy for leaders to be able to see people as whole beings that come to work and to recognize that. And I think that that's really more embedded in the culture that we create. How do we show up for each other? How do we hold space for each other? How do we speak to each other? And that's around collective understanding of shared values. Welcome to Talking with the Experts. This is where we discuss great ideas to take your business to the next level. How do we know these ideas work? Well, it's because we're talking with business owners who are using these ideas. Business owners who have years of experience and expertise. All things business by business owners for business owners. And now, here is your host, Rose Davidson. Hello, and welcome to Talking with the Experts. I'm your host, Rose Davidson from rosedavidson.com. Talking with the Experts is about all things business by business owners for business owners. You can find it on all good podcasting, streaming platforms, and on YouTube. Where does leadership start? Where does it begin? What about building relationships? Do you find that that is essential to a leadership position? Well, my next guest, Michelle Thompson from Curious Consulting, is going to discuss with us just that, leadership development. And Michelle is a registered nurse turned leadership development coach and consultant who teaches leaders how to prioritise human connections more than bottom lines and shift from feeling burned out and frustrated to aligned and authentic with ease so they can enjoy their work and become the leader that everyone needs. She has over 16 years of senior leadership experience and developed the person-centred leadership approach after personally experiencing the trauma inflicted on her by workplace dysfunction, ineffective communication and the feeling that things would never get better. Now, I know we've all been there at some point, especially in the corporate world. So welcome, Michelle, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, such a pleasure to wrap up my weekend with you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Um, so tell me, why did you turn from registered nurse to a leadership development um, strategist coach? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for asking. You know, it, I think it's one of those things where we just have to trust sometimes that the path will lead us to where we're supposed to be. You know, I, um, I uh, am still a nurse and I still practice nursing. And, uh, but I have really always been interested in creating healthy workplaces for people. And that's always been a passion of mine. And it was really trying to figure out how to start a business and do that. That was a little bit different. I thought that, you know, if I started a consulting business, it would have to be about creating policies and procedures for organizations and, and solely be based in curriculum um, development and creation. And what I realized is that, most organizations are really confused when it comes to leadership. And uh, while I believe that some are off the mark, I believe the most of them really want to treat their people well, and they want to be able to create safe spaces. So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the space I, I ended up in. And, and because I worked for many years in long-term care, uh, that has been really a, a place that has struggled over the years and, and one that's very familiar to me. So a lot of the clients that I work with, a lot of the healthcare professionals I work with are in that space. It, um, so leadership is, is a, I think, a very learned, a learned behavior. I don't think anyone's actually born a leader. And there's a difference between managers and leaders and in oftentimes in larger corporations, well, even in smaller ones, you know, the 
there's just not the communication there there should be um you know the worker thinks my god do i have to go back to this again tomorrow because you know they've been yelled at for something that you know is so inconsequential but you know the the manager leader will not uh, you know explain to them you know what they've done wrong how can leaders become more effective in their communications and how can staff manage upwards yeah that's a great question and you know i so so my philosophy i think of leadership may be a little bit different than others i really believe that we have made leadership far more complicated than it needs to be I really believe that that at, at its core, leadership is an exchange of energy between two people. The energy that I bring to any interaction I have with, with a, an employer, someone that I lead, is going to be at best matched. If I come in barking orders at people or I come in with, with a stern voice, nobody's going to say, hey, Michelle, thanks for that. Thanks for screaming. They're really going to uh, be met with some resistance and, you know, because that doesn't feel good. So it's really my job as a leader to be able to learn how to regulate my own emotions. And that's through understanding emotional intelligence and that my words matter and they carry a lot of weight and how and what I say uh, matters to people. But I think the other piece of that too is just recognizing that it's this is a human to human interaction and if i have no genuine interest in having a human connection with someone then maybe i should rethink my leadership strategy or whether or not leadership is really the direction that i that i want to go in and while i would argue that we're all leaders in all aspects of our life you know i think outside of the boardroom and in the boardroom we're all leaders at all levels However, in the truest form of a leadership where you are responsible for leading a group of people, I think that might be something that sometimes people have to consider it. And then I think that that's an honest conversation to have with yourself because my experience has been often that employers set their employees up for failure in that we often will hire people. And this is what happened to me. I was hired for a position because they knew that I was competent and capable to do the core functions of the job. And yet I was expected that I would just figure out the leadership portion. And that's just not, that's not realistic to assume that. I think that, that you know, organizations need to be able to recognize that leadership is a skill. And while we intrinsically are all hardwired to connect and we intrinsically have those innate capacities to connect with other human beings, learning how to do that in a workplace in the fastest way possible can be difficult. So, you know, I have two jobs as a leader. It's to build trust and at the core to keep people safe. That's it. And that's where, you know, everything stems around that for me. Yeah, on uh, quite often on this program, we we've um, I've discussed with you know various different people the difference between management and and leaders, and you know they all come down to the same you know thing. You know you can manage people, but to to be able to lead them, you, you actually have to allow the people to lead themselves and become a part of a team rather than um, individualize everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I often will recommend uh, organizations that I work with to get rid of the word employee altogether, take it out of their policies and procedures, just eliminate it. Because I think that when you um, when you think of someone as an employee or you speak in terms of the multiples, so my team, a team, you forget that those are individual people. And, you know, while it is difficult to lead individuals because everybody has you know, uh, certain needs, it is possible to do that without it, you know, causing an extraordinary amount of energy for leaders to be able to see people as whole beings that come to work and to recognize that. And I think that that's really more embedded in the culture that we create. How do we show up for each other? How do we hold space for each other? How do we speak to each other? And that's around collective understanding of shared values. And, and, and that culture that we create. So um, yeah, I, I love what you said. I, I think that we really need to start looking at people as opposed to when we're leading, as opposed to uh, labeling people as employees or teams. Yeah, um, how can we, you know, how can people, you know, set these healthy boundaries that we all need? And um, some of us aren't, you know, very good at, at holding space for boundaries. 
Well, that's a loaded question. And I, and I'm certainly, I have the gift of gab, so it won't be a, an easy one. You know, what I found uh, during COVID particularly was I was doing a lot of education and training to healthcare providers uh, around self-care, not being selfish. And, and while I recognize that that's a kitschy term, I, I intentionally did that because people understand what that means. Uh, and halfway through these training sessions, I realized that I myself was setting some of them up for failure because when we were talking about self-care, it was sort of in that Maslow's hierarchy of needs with self-care being at the very top of that pyramid or, you know, the equivalent to the self-actualization when you look at Maslow's. And that's really like, that's the ultimate goal is to be able to get to that, that place of, of being able to um, nurture yourself with self-care and, and not feeling bad about it. But what I realized is not just for healthcare providers, but particularly for people that are in a service industry where they feel that if they're in service to others, it's all or nothing. And often that's to the detriment of their own mental health. And because of that, they are consummate people pleasers. They're often perfectionists. And they have an extremely difficult time setting boundaries. So it's sort of like those other two bottom corners of, of that triangle that if you aren't able to kind of, you know, um, establish those, those bottom pieces, which would be the same as air, water, food, shelter, those are basic needs that we all need to survive. It's really hard to get to that self-actualization piece. So boundary setting can be very, very difficult uh, for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. So I think it's first really looking at uh, I often have people go through an exercise and it's called my circle of influence. And it's really looking at you know, your inner circle. And those are the people that generally are the, are the closest ones to you. Those are the ones that you feel that you can share your deep, dark secrets to. Um, and then those, that middle circle, which could be, um, you know, closer friends, but, you know, maybe work colleagues. And then that outer circle, which is typically community members. They're people that, you know, um, you might have a social uh, relationship with, but, but they're not part of that inner circle. And really looking at is that balanced and who's in those different spheres and why are they there? And if you have everyone in your, in your inner, in your middle circle and no one on that outer circle, sometimes that tells people there's a real imbalance where you're allowing people into those circles uh, and you're not setting boundaries. So you're giving, 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 and often you're not getting anything back in return. You know, there's, there's three different generally personality types. And there's kind of the, the and, and I hate to say this sometimes because it has a bit of a negative connotation, but there, um, there's research to show that there's people that are called the givers, the takers, and the matchers. And so this is part of that exercise I just spoke of. So the, the, the takers and the matchers are kind of the almost neck and neck when, when we think about the people that we engage with. The takers are those people that will be, you know, the people that call you only when they need something, but if you need something, sometimes they're not always available. They're in it for themselves. The matchers are kind of the, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? There has to be something in it for them. And the givers, which is sadly the smallest group of those three are the people who are like, those are your people. They're rain or shine, no matter what you need them there for you and they're showing up. And so, so the second part of that exercise is to really look at when you look at your, your spheres of influence in your circles, how many matchers and takers and givers do you have in each of those? And is that balanced? Because again, sometimes we have to really look at those relationships and why they're there. And is it just because it's a family member and we're afraid to say, you know, um, I, you know, this isn't, this isn't working out for me. This is not aligning with my core values. We don't do that because we don't want to create sort of family drama, uh, you know, and, and then you work out from there and that's a very individualized approach, but that's one, one place where I have people start. That's a really great place to start too. Uh, I, cause we, we don't often look at it. We don't, you know, categorize people into into little slots. We just, you know, accept them as they are. And then our own mental health, well-being, sanity goes out the window because we're trying to, you know, please everybody and uh, and not pleasing ourselves. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your person-centered leadership approach, if I could. And what does the person stand for? Yes, thank you so much for asking. So this came from many, many years of uh, just feeling like I 
was drowning. I, um, if, if anyone has uh, gone to my website uh, and seen that, you'll see the bit of the backstory, but essentially I was working in a long-term care home and uh, was fairly new. I had only been working there for three or four months and showed up to work one day and was told that uh, our licensing, our healthcare licensing inspectors were coming to do an impromptu inspection at the long-term care home I was working at, which here in Canada where I'm living is not unusual for them to, to come and do an inspection. And I was promptly told, well, no, they're actually coming to because of you, because of a complaint that was received because of you. And I thought, oh, okay. Um, and, and what had happened was one of the nurses working in our home had complained that I had tried to, she accused me of covering up the death of a resident. And it was one of those moments that, you know, you never forget. I, I, I mean, I remember feeling the blood drain from my body mm -hmm. and I couldn't understand why someone would do this to me because leading up to this, I had really tried to be one of those inclusive leaders where I was trying to give people autonomy and not micromanage. I was really trying to allow people to have a voice and do fun things in the workplace. And things seemed to be going well for the first few months. And then there started to be this really subtle shift and, and feeling of disengagement from the employees. And I couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And it was really um, during this two-day investigation where they clearly found that there was no evidence to show that I had uh, you know, done what I was being accused of. And when they spoke with the nurse who made the allegations, uh, she had said, she sort of, she came out and said, well, I embellished conversations that happened because I thought that if I could get Michelle fired, things would go back to the way they were, meaning that they could kind of do whatever they wanted whenever they wanted. And it was in that moment that I realized that I was actually the sixth general manager in seven years. Wow. And that the home was not running well. And there had been this huge turnover in this culture that this kind of behavior was appropriate. And this is what would fix the problem. And I realized that I was so ill prepared to lead this dysfunctional team that I started having panic attacks every day going to work because I, I didn't know what to do. So, you know, you, I think in those moments, you, you, um, you, you have a couple of options and, and I chose to kind of do the deep dive. And I was lucky that I had a few mentors who I was able to draw from years of experience, which I am, you know, forever grateful, but I really didn't have the support from senior leaders in my organization. I was new to the job. So this was really a world I was navigating. And it was really just over years and years of, of my experience of, in terms of what was working and what wasn't working came the leadership um, approach that I've created. So it is an acronym. The P stands for personal connections. So this is really understanding the mechanics behind how humans are hardwired to connect. Why are we hardwired to connect? And really having leaders feel empowered that as I said earlier, the, you know, I think we've made leadership far more complicated than it needs to be. I have a bookshelf full of leadership books and I love them all and I've read them and they have a place. But at the end of the day, it's not about acquiring specific attributes or following a path from A, B, C to D. It's recognizing that everything you have to be an extraordinary leader, you already have inside you. It's really understanding how you're hardwired, why you hold space in the way you do for people in terms of how you view the world and understanding that allows you then to become an extraordinary leader to others but you really have to do the deep dive into self first so then the e is the emotional intelligence we've all heard this so it's all of those components around understanding how we um how our our behavior our actions our our body language, the words that we use, how we use those words, uh, how that will resonate with people and recognizing that also we're not going to be everybody's everything and that's okay. Everybody's not going to like you as a leader. And, and that's something that we have to just have our ego step aside and recognize that um, being an extraordinary leader doesn't mean that you are an extraordinary leader for every person. That's just not realistic. The R is respectful communication. So again, it's really understanding and doing the deep dive into how do you have a, 
a, you know, a reciprocal conversation with someone where sometimes it's difficult. You're having really difficult conversations with people. It could be through a performance review. It could be through a termination. It could be through supporting somebody who is underperforming in the workplace. And, and how do you hold space for that type you know, of situation? The S is self-care. That's what we've just talked about. It's, it's critical that all leaders make sure that they figure out how to uh, prioritize and make time for self. Um, and then the O is ongoing learning and education, which is important for all of us. And then finally, the N is leaving no one behind. And this really comes from, I have been honored to work with several First Nations communities here in British Columbia, where I live in Canada. And this was some um, information that was uh, given to me through knowledge keepers and elders in terms of recognizing that it's sort of all or nothing. You, everybody has to be all in or we do nothing um, because you will never leave someone behind. I have to, this is about the culture of an organization. When we're creating culture, everybody has to be seen and feel seen and heard as part of that culture or we're doing something wrong. So that's that last piece. Yeah. Very interesting. I, I really like the acronym and I like um, everything that it stands for. It's, I think, how all the world should be uh, like that, not just workplaces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Michelle, uh, have you written a book on this topic at all? Not yet, but there's one in the works, so stay tuned. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd really like to read it and get to, to know a little bit more about you know, this person-centred leadership approach. I think it's absolutely awesome um thank you i i uh, started off i actually have an eight week online leadership program and uh we're in the middle of it right now i i've got uh nine amazing souls going through that program with me and uh so i started off with the program first but the the book is is there i've, I've got the chapters kind of mapped out i just need to to get it uh from from the brain to the paper yeah that's the hardest bit isn't it yeah you know, it's all in yeah. there but getting it on the paper is another matter altogether exactly <laughs> yeah michelle it's been a pleasure i'd love to i'd love people to be able to connect with you where can they find you yeah i, I mean primarily i'm on linkedin or sorry, on um, Instagram, I am on LinkedIn as well. But if you go to Instagram, because you can put your link tree bio there, it just will link to all other social platforms. So I generally have people go there. Um, and it's Curis, which is C-U-R-I-S underscore consulting. And then, like I said, my link tree is there. But if you want to go to my website, which is also, I've got all of my social media attached and um, everything I do is there. It's at um, the same thing. So it's www.curisconsulting.ca. Perfectly perfect. Um, have you got any words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us today? I, you know, I think that for me, you know, one of the things that I wish I would have known early on was just to show up as I am. And nobody's looking for you to be perfect. Nobody is looking for you to have all of the answers in any part of our life. And I think the people that we feel closest to and we resonate most with and, and come off as being the most genuine and authentic are those that show up as they are and are afraid to, or not afraid to show their flaws and when they don't know something, but have an eagerness to learn and to kind of say, come on, let, let, let's, you know, do this together. And, and I think that, um, you know, if we can all show a little bit more vulnerability uh, at, when we're in a leading role, that would certainly go a long way. And, and, the, and I recognize that that's hard for a lot of people to do. Uh, but I think that when people realize that being vulnerable doesn't necessarily mean that you have to show your whole underbelly, um, but it's just really about uh, making it really, really human and showing some empathy and kindness to people, um, it goes such a long way. Uh, empathy and kindness would be is so much needed in the world right at this particular moment. Yes. Um, ne not, it's been needed forever, but I think never more than now. I think it, the world is such a sad place. I agree. I agree. We, uh, I think we have learned a lot in the past several years, um, but we just keep getting things sort of thrown at us collectively. And, um, you know, I hope that we've, we've all taken away personal learnings from the last few years, but uh, as a whole, um, you know, uh, 
the, the world will never be a bad place with more empathetic and kind people. Absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. Michelle, I've so much enjoyed our conversation today. I hope you'll come back again um, another time and we can discuss this a little bit further. I think it's a terrific topic and um, I think our listeners would have uh, will gain a lot from what you've had to share with us today. Thank you so much, Rose. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Talking with the Experts, hosted by Rose Davidson. Make sure you have a look at our back catalogue over at talkingwiththeexperts.com and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any episode. We look forward to your company next time. Talking with the Experts.